Good morning and welcome to church. Last Sunday was what we call White Gift Sunday. This Sunday, let's call it Lockdown Sunday. That seems to be the most appropriate. Or perhaps we could call it the third Sunday in Advent and Bible Builders Church School Concert Sunday and Advent Concert Sunday. And perhaps most simply, an opportunity to come into the presence of God and for us to give our worship to God. Let's begin with the words from Presbyterian World Service and Development, our Advent reading. In this season of Advent, we celebrate God's joy, knowing that Christ is coming to bring healing and wholeness to the world is a source of delight. When we gather for worship, it is a celebration, an opportunity to rejoice in all that God is doing among us and beyond us. And we welcome our neighbors and celebrate God's goodness. Even when we face difficulty and trouble, we sing a song of faith, confident that Jesus is able to redeem our suffering world. Together, we are a sign of God's joy for the world. So we light the candle of joy. Today we have uh, Judy on piano, Victoria uh, directing our uh, church school concert, and Matthias directing the anthem. And let's begin with this beautiful Advent song, O Come, O Come. Emmanuel. Let us pray. Lord, 
fill our hearts today with joy, the joy of the Lord. For you are the God who created all things. In your power, you created the heavens and the earth. In your wisdom, you created the beauty and the design of all living things. In your image, you created us, both male and female. In your love, you have reached out to us in many ways, through creation, through angels, through prophets, through scripture. And in these last days, you have reached out to us through your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave up the rights and freedoms of heaven to become human. Thank you, Jesus, for being born in poverty and darkness. Thank you for your saving grace to be born in our poverty and darkness. Lord, we confess that we are lost without you. We get lost in pride and ego and stubbornness. We lose ourselves in worldly things and sinful thoughts. We find ourselves at times with resentment and anger. Lord, who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, help us to keep finding your love, your grace, your truth, renewed in our lives every day, and to find our highest joy in you. Thank you for your forgiveness, which is ours today. Thank you for teaching us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to the debut of The Real House Lives of Bethlehem, followed by the anthem. Good morning, and welcome to this year's Bible Builders Church School concert. Although, I guess since it's being recorded, you could be watching it at any time. So, good afternoon and good evening, too. As we're all well aware, things look very different this year we weren't able to get together for in-class rehearsals like normal. So we've been working hard in our own homes to record this and put it together. We were also very fortunate this year to have some of our senior, senior, senior highs be a part of the concert as well. We hope that you enjoy it and that it brings some of the magic and joy of Christmas into your lives and that next year we'll be together to worship again in the sanctuary. We can't sing carols like we normally would. We know for a lot of people, Christmas carols are their favorite part of the season. So this year, we'll be singing along at home. We're fortunate that Monica was willing to share her skills with us. So we have the music for the carols we all know and love. And the words will be on the screen so you can sing along at home. Sing like no one is listening. Because really, they aren't. It's much too cold outside to be eavesdropping on your neighbors. We're going to hear from the characters in the Christmas story in their homes as they realize the promise of God's love is fulfilled through Jesus. This year, instead of bringing everyone together in church, we've decided to take a sneak peek into their lives at home while we get to hear their side of the story. We'll visit with some familiar faces and maybe hear from a few characters who don't normally get to speak. So let's start our sneak peek into the real house lives of Bethlehem with a trip to Nazareth and find out what was really happening around Jesus' birth. Oh, hello there. Nice to see you. I guess you're wondering who we are. Well, we're the Coens. We live next door to Elizabeth and Zacchaeus in Hebron. Hebron. You know, they have that lovely boy, John. Such a nice boy. 
It was such a miracle when he was born. Elizabeth is like the rest of us. No one's getting any younger, you know. But the angel Gabriel appeared to Zachariah in the temple and then one day told him not to be afraid that Elizabeth was going to have a baby. Wasn't that something? It sure was. It sure was. They were to call the baby John. Well, of course, Zacharias didn't believe Gabriel. No. And so the angel no. struck him dumb, just like that. And Zachariah couldn't speak until John was born and named in the temple. It was amazing. John was about to be named after Zachariah's father, but Zacharias wrote down that the babies was to be called John. And suddenly Zachariah could speak again. What a miracle. And of course, you, you know who, who Elizabeth's cousin is? Oh yeah. She's Mary, mm. spouse, that's right. Joseph's wife, Jesus' mother. Mm -mm. Actually, actually, Mary came to stay with Elizabeth for a while before the baby was born. And when she came, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow. Until then, I don't think Elizabeth had an ounce of Holy Spirit in her. But just when Mary came and, and said that the baby was going to be special, there and then the Holy Spirit came to her. And Elizabeth said to Mary, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I favoured so that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Blessed is he who believes that the Lord would fulfil promises to her. Or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something like that. It's not that we were listening, of course. No, 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 no. I mean, it's not our fault that they built the houses so closely so together. Close. No, no. And Elizabeth is a loud talker, isn't she? <laughs> anyway, it was quite amazing. And to think that these stories show just how God is and how God fulfills his promises to God's people. Oh, dear. Were you talking to my cousin Elizabeth? No, that's true. She's quite so shy. Plus, she has some very tiny neighbors. She was telling me last time I was up there they're, that they're lovely people, but she can never seem to get a word in edgewise when they're around. I'm not sure what to tell you. I don't know what you've heard already, but here's the scoop. Joseph and I were supposed to get married. He's such a good man, my Joe. He's a carpenter, you know. While I was home one day, an angel suddenly appeared and told me that I was going to have a baby. I wasn't even married yet. There was no way I was going to have a baby. But the angel didn't listen and just kept going. I think most people know the rest of the story. It all worked out. Joseph and I head to Bethlehem, and then before you know it, Jesus was born. If you want, I can go get Joseph, and you can chat with him too. Although since he's a man, he didn't have a lot to do except get me to Bethlehem and make sure the donkey was well stocked with snacks. Pregnant ladies get hungry, you know. They're eating for two. So I'm not sure what he'll have to add to the story. Joe, Joseph, Joseph, hey, there's some people who want to talk to you. Listen, I don't have a lot of spare time. You call me right in the middle of things. But anyways, here's the actual true story. You know, when anyone hears the word angel or sees me in my glowing outfit, they get scared, which honestly hurts a little bit. I'm a great angel. Everyone says I'm fun, friendly, and outgoing. Anyways, this is the actual true story. I showed up at Mary's house to tell her that she was highly favored with the Lord and she was to have a baby. He was going to be a great man and his kingdom would have no end. She was to call him Jesus but he would also be known as the Son of the Most High. She seemed a little confused, so I reassured her that with God, anything is possible. That seemed to help, so I left. Ooh. Oh, I heard Mary call. Sorry, I was just on my workshop. I don't know what you've heard already, but while I may not be Jesus' father, I played a big part in this whole story. Mary and I were engaged, and suddenly when we found out we were going to have a baby, I was not thrilled, that's for sure. I was really thinking of not really going through with the whole wedding and just quietly end things. So I didn't cause too much of a big fuss, but then an angel came to me. 
The angel spoke to me and said that it was going to be okay, and that this was all part of God's plan. The angel said to call the baby Jesus, since he would save people from their sins. So I stayed with Mary, and we traveled together to Bethlehem, since we had to go there for the census. When we got to Bethlehem, things were pretty packed, but, you know, thanks to my savvy skills, we managed to get into a great place to stay at a low price. And while we were there, Mary gave birth to the baby, and we named him Jesus, just like we had been told to do, and it was amazing. Let's hurry and tell them before they change their minds. So there we were, getting ready to head off to Bethlehem, since that's where our family is from. We had to go to our hometown because of the census that the Romans wanted. We had everything and everyone all packed up, and we were gathered a huge group of us, all traveling together. It was pretty crowded and busy, but it was going to be a great trip. It was like a little vacation, really, a break from the everyday. Yeah, but it was also smelly and noisy, and we didn't get to take all our stuff with us, and I really didn't want to go. Every time we see family we haven't seen in a while, it's all pinching my cheeks, and oh my, you've grown. I haven't seen you in so long. And do you remember the time you ate 30 days really quickly and then were really sick? Uh, no, because I was two, and I, I mean, really, people, get over and move on. Anyway, people don't need to hear about the past. I'm sure they'd much rather hear about our new best friends, Mary and Joe. You hung out with them so much, we could tell you all about them and their story. I mean, you could just tell when you met them that there was something special about them. There actually isn't much we can tell you. They were a lovely couple. I really felt for Mary as she was pregnant and all the traveling. Well, she can't have been comfortable, and you never heard her complain. They said they were heading to Bethlehem since her husband Joseph was a descendant of David. They didn't have anywhere lined up in, to stay in Bethlehem. I think his family was pretty full, and they wanted a bit of peace and quiet. I suggested my cousin's inn, but we lost track of them And we, when we all arrived in Bethlehem. They really were a lovely couple, and I really hope that it worked out for them. Joseph and Mary. They stayed here and I gave them my best room. Okay, maybe not my best room, but a great room. Fine, not a great room, but a good room. Okay, not a good room, but a room at least. Fine, fine, all right, it wasn't exactly a room. The poor kids had nowhere to go and everywhere in Bethlehem was booked full. I felt so sorry for them. She was pregnant and they both looked so tired, so I offered up what I had. It wasn't great, but it was sheltered and warm and dry. Okay, it might have been a little bit smelly, but the animals sure didn't complain. Just my little joke there. I let them stay in the cave out back I use as my stable. I even let them use the animal's manger 
as a makeshift cradle. They seemed so calm and full of peace, even during a stress-filled time. They didn't even mind when the shepherds showed up and bothered them after the baby was born. What? Bothered them? We did not bother them. How dare people say we bothered them? Just because we went to visit that lovely couple, Mary and Joseph, not long after the baby was born? What nerve! We weren't bothering anyone. I mean, there we were, out in the fields, abiding. Wait! We were what? I thought we were with our sheep! I didn't know we were also abiding, too! It's not easy being shepherd, you know. Not only do we have to spend more time with our sheep than with other people, but we have to protect them at all costs. We're out here in all weathers and all times of the year, looking after our flocks, keeping them safe from wolves and thieves and the like. And now you tell me we were also a damn a minding? How do we have time for that too? No wonder shepherding life is so hard. Abiding means we were out there living with our flocks. Nothing extra. It's just a much more succinct way of saying what you just said. But none of this was important. What, what's really important is what happened while we were out there abiding. It was absolutely amazing. There we were. Uh, with our sheep abiding and suddenly there was an angel sharing us with us the great news the angel told us that the messiah had been born in, the, in a manger and that we could find him laying there wrapped in swaddling clothes then a whole host of angels appeared and were saying glory to god in the highest it was mind-blowing we had to rush off to bethlehem right away to go and see the this miracle from god and then, when we had seen the miracle, the baby, we had to go and share the news of God, God's promise with everyone we saw. The shepherds are nice. They take good care of me and my family. I'll be honest, some of my family seem to have wool everywhere, including their ears. I, I mean, more wool than they're supposed to have. So the shepherds do a great job keeping us safe. That night, they got told some amazing news. I think they rushed off to make sure everyone knew about it. It was so fun. We all went and told the shepherds the good news about Jesus. They were amazed, but they went to see him just like we had told them too. They told everyone about God's promise. There we were minding our own business just out for an evening stroll when suddenly those shepherds came out of nowhere and started going on all about some baby and miracle and angels. To be honest at first we didn't even know what they were talking about. But the more we listened the more we understood. They were telling us about the Messiah, about God's promise. It really was a miracle. We were lucky to have run into the shepherds. After all this had happened, but we'd been traveling for a long time. We'd seen a star, and we knew it meant something big. We took it as a promise, and we headed out to follow it.
It was a long journey. Smelly camels, snoring companions, and changeable weather. But we pressed on. We traveled with our camels in our presence because we knew that the king we were going to see would be worthy of our gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I know people say it's not the destination, but the journey, but they've never been on camels for months at a time. Besides, which our destination was absolutely incredible, there's no way that anything could be better than what we ended up seeing. It truly was the fulfillment of the amazing promise we'd seen in the star. The journey didn't end when we arrived in Jerusalem. We had to go meet with King Herod, as it was only polite. But ugh, he was so slimy and scheming. He wanted to know all about the baby and where we'd been, he'd been born. Herod even asked us to come back and tell him when we'd found the baby. Well, we followed the star, found Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, and we presented our gifts to him. We were overjoyed to have come to the end of our journey and to have seen Jesus. Afterwards, we had a dream that warned us about Herod and told us to go home a different way. So that's what we did. The whole trip was incredible. I'm so happy we followed that star. It's amazing to see the promise of God's love back then and know that it's still here today. While we might not have been first on the scene or been informed by angels, Jesus is still in our lives today. And we have God's love each and every day, Christmas or not. Thank you for joining us as we peered through the curtains into the real house lives of Bethlehem to see just how much the promise of God's love is there for everyone.
Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 to 11. Let's hear the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory, because their shame was double, and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot. Therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery, robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being will exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, which goes out and does not return back empty, but accomplishes your purposes. Allow your word to speak to us today by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. There is no joy in Mudville, as it says in the poem, Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer. This is a surprisingly old poem that was written in 1888 about the game of baseball. The poem describes the hometown baseball team being down by two runs in the final inning. The crowd of 5,000 fans believes that the team can win if only the star player, the mighty Casey, gets to bat. The first two batters fail to get on base, so they're down to their final out. But the next two batters, well, not as strong as the first two, manage to get a single followed by a double. With two on, Casey comes to the plate. Confidently, the mighty Casey lets two pitches go by for strikes. He grits his teeth and at the next pitch, strikes out. There is no joy in Mudville. Casey at the bat is full of descriptive language and action and suspense. It was a hit soon after it was published and over the years has become a cultural phenomenon. And it's described as the single most famous baseball poem ever written. It's also timeless in a way because it speaks about the, the glories of winning and the shock of losing. And we can identify with and relate to these words quite easily. Perhaps we feel like we just can't win. 
or we can't catch a break, or we can't seem to get out of this rut, or our health, or our grades, or our financial situation, or our record should be better by now than it is. Or we should have reached this milestone, or life just seems to be a series of losses. Perhaps there is no joy for us in Mudville. But our passage in Isaiah reminds us that the end of the story belongs to the Lord. And because of that, we can rejoice. That's true even if we find ourselves moving two steps forward and one step back, even if there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, or we have things to look, look forward to, or we have been able to keep things simple in life, our confidence isn't just in the immediate future. Our confidence is best placed in the Lord. The end of the story belongs to the Lord, and because of that, we can rejoice. Isaiah chapter 61 is an amazing chapter that speaks about good news and healing and freedom and restoration. Isaiah 61 is written in the first person and it has connections with the four servant songs in Isaiah chapters 42 and 49 and 50 and 53. The servant songs speak about Israel and the current situation of being in exile. And the servant songs also speak about and point to the Messiah, the Lord's servant to come. So for the current situation of being in exile, Isaiah proclaims the year of Jubilee. This is the year of the Lord's favor. According to Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee happened every 50 years where the land was allowed to rest or to lay fallow and all debts were supposed to be canceled and even slaves were set free. Uh, this was supposed to be the year when freedom reigned all throughout the land. And it was supposed to happen every 50 years, although there's little record of it ever being practiced. But Isaiah makes this proclamation because the time of exile was coming to an end. They would be allowed to return home soon to rebuild ancient ruins and restore their cities. But more than that, they would be comforted. Their sadness and sorrow would be replaced with gladness and praise. And even more than that, they would be testifying to the Lord's goodness and be called oaks of righteousness and priests of the Lord and ministers of our God. The picture here is of the year of Jubilee and the return from exile and up uplifted spirits and a new calling to serve the Lord. And that time would come after about 70 years in exile in Babylon, the Persian King Cyrus or Cyrus the Great took over and allowed the Israelite exiles to return to their homeland. Not only that, but Cyrus returned items stolen from the temple in Jerusalem. This eventually led to the rebuilding of the temple by Zerubbabel and the renewal of the covenant with the Lord by Ezra and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem by Nehemiah. The current situation of exile would be reversed and Israel would be restored. In our current situation, there are many things that we are looking forward to and hoping to be reversed and restored. Of course, we hope for an end to the pandemic and for vaccines to be effective and people to be safe and, and a lifting of restrictions, that's probably top of mind right now. Or maybe we're hoping for simple things like paying off our debt or getting a job or a clean bill of health or comfort 
following a loss, or a break from school, or maybe just a white Christmas. All those things will be wonderful if and when they happen. But even if we still find ourselves waiting, or even if other problems come our way, our passage reminds us that the end of the story belongs to the Lord. And because of that, we can rejoice. Isaiah chapter 61 also points to the Messiah, the Lord's servant to come. The beginning of Jesus' ministry is marked by his reading of Isaiah 61. When he was in his hometown of Nazareth, in the synagogue there, he was given the scroll of Isaiah. It was handed to him. And Jesus opened it to Isaiah 61 and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus handed back the scroll, went back to his seat and said, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus would live out these words of Isaiah 61 by healing the sick and casting out demons and teaching about the kingdom of God and offering God's forgiveness. Jesus would ultimately give his life so that we could be spiritually healed from sin and selfishness and separation from God. And Jesus promised so much more. By rising from the grave, Jesus promised this great restoration. He promised to go and prepare a place for us. Death doesn't have a final say. Death isn't the end. In his Father's house are many rooms. The end of the story belongs to the Lord, and because of that, we can rejoice. Eighteen years after the poem, Casey at the Bat, was written, uh, that, so that was in 1888. So in 1906, a famous sports writer by the name of Grantland Rice wrote a follow-up to the poem, and he entitled this one, Casey's Revenge. The setting is weeks after the mighty Casey had struck out. Now there were 10,000 fans in the stands, but this time the mighty Casey hit a grand slam to win the game. I guess they would call that a walk-off. The poem finishes, Mudville hearts are happy now for Casey hit the ball. You know, the follow-up poem was popular, but certainly never became as famous as the original. For us in our current situation, whatever losses we have had to endure, whatever ruts we find ourselves in, and whatever breaks don't come our way, there is more. There is a follow-up poem, but thankfully it's not written by us. Thankfully we don't have to engineer it ourselves because we aren't able to carry that burden, and we don't have to either. Instead, in our passage, the call is to find joy in the Lord. In verse 10, Isaiah is able to greatly rejoice in the Lord, and with his whole being, he's able to exult in my God. Isaiah didn't see the complete fulfillment of the promises of God in his lifetime, but he knew the future was in good hands. So during this time of Advent, as we wait for Christmas, let's ourselves rejoice greatly in the Lord and with our whole being exult in our God. The promise of good news and healing and freedom and restoration came in the form of a baby born in Bethlehem, and one remarkable life. 
It comes to us today because God's kingdom has come and God's spirit has been given to us. And it will come in the future because the end of the story belongs to the Lord. Because of all of this, we can rejoice. Let us pray. Lord, even now there are longings in our heart, things that we carry with us every day, perhaps even burdens. Yet your word tells us that your servant came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to bind up the brokenhearted and to comfort all who mourn. Please accomplish that work in our lives today. Help us to know the joy of the Lord, to be able to rejoice because we know that there is more, that you hold the future in your hands, that you are full of mercy and kindness and abounding in steadfast love, that you call us to trust in you with all our heart, and that there will be a great restoration one day with the establishment of your kingdom. That's the day that we are waiting for. Lord, help us to rejoice in all that you are doing, even when our current situation is difficult. We pray for those going through difficult times, whether in mourning or with health problems, or uncertain about their future, or struggling with anxiety, or having a hard time with a family relationship. Lord, our lives are in your hands, so we ask for your mercy and your healing. Use us as your instruments of grace to be able to help others going through difficult times. May our lives testify to your grace, both in word and deed. And thank you that you hear our prayers. So we pray this in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Well, we turn now to our time of offering. Uh, please don't feel obligated to give or that you must give. Uh, but when we give out of appreciation and thanksgiving, uh, God has blessed and we in turn bless God. Information on how to give is below in the video notes. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Thank you for every blessing in our lives. So please, Lord, set apart this offering that we give to you for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few thank yous and a few announcements. Thank you to Victoria and for the Bible Builders Church School and everyone who participated and put together this wonderful uh, Christmas concert this morning. Thank you to uh, Roseanne and John Dimitru and all the conveners and everyone who helped put together a wonderful uh, Christmas market just wrapped up on Thursday. Thank you to everyone who has given Christmas gifts to the Kanjikum and to local families in need. Uh, today is the deadline, so thank you. Today at 1 p.m., there is an Advent concert with our choral scholars and uh, registration information is found in our weekly email or on our website. On Tuesday, we have an online prayer meeting. Everyone's welcome. On Wednesday, uh, we will take loaves of sandwiches and bags of clothes down to Evangel Hall. You can drop it off at the back door of the church uh, from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. on that day, so that this coming Wednesday. Thank you also in advance. And one final announcement. Thank you so much to everyone for your continued support of the Bible Builders Church School Ministry. This upcoming week, the last week, for dropping off your waterproof mittens and gloves and warm hats. We're also so accepting donations of men's and women's underwear in sizes medium to double extra large. If you would like to donate to this important mission, there will be someone at the church Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m., Thursday from 1.30 to 2.30, and Saturday from 9 to 10. Thank you for helping us to support Evangel Hall. 
Let's close with this benediction from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And we close with joy to the world.